everybody, thank you so much uh, for attending um, the uh, first ever Santa Monica History Museum uh, Throwback Thursdays event. Um, we really appreciate you being here. Um, I, I think, and Sarah, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I, I think this is the first virtual event our museum's ever done. Am I right about that? Oh, I believe so. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to kick off uh, this evening. Um, we are really pleased uh, to have one of our very own uh, as, as our, our speaker for our first event, and that's uh, museum archivist Sarah Crown. Sarah's been the archivist for the Santa Monica History Museum since 2015. She completed her undergraduate degree at Scripps College and earned a dual master's in art history and library science from the Pratt Institute in New York. After working in the archives of Scholastic and Coach Inc., Sarah returned to Santa Monica to take on her current role at the Santa Monica History Museum. While at the museum, Sarah has curated 15 exhibitions including our current one on women's suffrage in California and authored essays published in Santa Monica, A Look Back to 1902 from Today and Santa Monica Pleasure Pier, A Look Back from 1917 to Today. Uh, we are uh, grateful and honored to have her kick off the series for us. And with that, uh, please welcome Sarah Crown. Thank you, Rob. Welcome everybody. We're glad you're joining us. I'd like to thank our wonderful team of museum staff and volunteers, in particular Anne Wallentine, who co-curated our current exhibition. The exhibition honors the year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Though the amendment passed in 1919, it was not ratified until the following year in 1920, hence 2020. The name of the exhibition, All is Possible, Women's Suffrage in California, references local suffragist Caroline Severance and her signature phrase, nothing is impossible for organized womanhood. The images you'll see during this presentation are all in the exhibition and there is much more to see in including letters, documents, and objects. You may notice I use the term suffragist rather than suffragette. This is because suffrage activists viewed suffragette as a derogatory term. It was coined by those attempting to belittle the movement. The suffix et was used to emphasize the demure aspect of femininity equating women with children who lacked agency and independence. Contemporary press images show how suffragists were mocked, belittled, and assumed to be bitter spinsters. So what is suffrage? It is the right to vote in political elections. Prior to the women's suffrage movement, males, and until 1870, white males, were believed to be the only citizens with enough intelligence to make political and civic decisions. Legally, women were forced to rely on men, whether husbands, fathers, or brothers, to be their voice. Women could not own property, though California was the one exception to that rule. They could not be legal guardians of children and could not request a divorce. So a side note here, under Mexican law, California women had the right to own property, a right that was retained when the United States annexed California in 1850. Fighting this lack of agency was the foundation of the suffrage movement. Voting meant not only equality with men, but a voice for women and the ability to act in the best interest of themselves and other women. Early suffragists were inspired by indigenous societies like the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, in which women held equal power to men and enjoyed rights such as property ownership, initiating divorces, and voting. This coalition encompassed a group of six indigenous nations in what is now New York State and was the oldest continuous democracy in the world. Its longevity proved that such a model could work. While early American society insisted on women's place in the home, 
the industrial age opened opportunities for women in workforce. By the turn of the 20th century, the new woman was in vogue, an educated, independent woman who was freer to engage in physical and intellectual activity. World War I accelerated this shift with women taking on wartime jobs. National organizations for women's suffrage began forming during the mid to late 1800s as an outgrowth of the anti-slavery movement. Women suffragists gained momentum as black men achieved citizenship and enfranchisement. D despite the movement's roots in justice causes, however, suffragists of color continued to face discrimination within the movement as they fought for equal rights as individuals and as women. The suffragists' own statements show that they embraced an identity of militancy and rebellion. They clearly saw the movement's success as essential to equality and used strikingly modern sounding language. Here are a few of their statements. Charlotta Spears Bass, who's on the far left, noted, there's a strange truth about suppression. It seldom works. And Lucretia Mott in the center explained, any great change must expect opposition because it shakes the very foundation of privilege. Matilda Jocelyn Gage on the far right declared, a rebel, how glorious the name sounds when applied to woman. Oh, rebellious woman, to you the world looks in hope. They did not shy away from confrontation. Defiant protest tactics pioneered by the suffragists, such as picketing the White House, are still being used by activists today. The Women's Christian Temperance Union, led by Frances Willard, also played a key role in the movement. Willard is there on the left. Its leaders saw that voting rights could help societal wrongs, help right societal wrongs. The temperance movement campaigned against alcohol use. Their goal was to protect women from abusive spouses and husbands who overspent on alcohol, which strained household. Under Frances Willard's leadership, the influential group also advocated for suffrage and social reform. However, their support caused the powerful alcohol lobby to oppose women's suffrage, as the lobby believed all women would vote for temperance. Suffragists of color fought both racism and sexism. The motto for the National Association of Colored Women was lifting as we climb. It signified their goal of improving life for black Americans as they gained additional rights. Leading black suffragists like Mary Eliza Church Terrell on the right often encountered white leaders efforts to sideline them. In 1913, the women's suffrage procession in Washington attempted to keep black women from marching, instead offering for them to participate as segregated delegations. African-American women's clubs rallied around racial and suffrage issues, despite being barred from many white women's clubs and protests. Local Los Angeles area clubs included the Sojourner Truth Industrial Club, the Progressive Women's Club, the Helping Hand Society, and the Stickney Women's Christian Temperance Union in Los Angeles. Los Angeles-based suffragist Charlotta Spears Bass, here on the left, the first African-American woman to run a newspaper in the United States, also used her newspaper, The California Eagle, to champion intersecting issues of equal rights reform. That is the newspaper office on the right. Though ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920 gave white women the right to vote, it excluded many women. The ability of African American women to fulfill that right was severely hampered. States enacted numerous regulations targeting voters of color, such as poll taxes and literacy tests. While white suffragists shifted organizational focus to voter registration once suffrage passed, black suffragists held voter registration drives while also working to repeal restrictive voting measures. The United States also had vicious Chinese and Japanese exclusion policies during the 19th and 20th centuries, 
especially in California, where many Asian immigrants settled. Activists like Mabel, Mabel Pingwa Lee, pictured here, fought for women's suffrage despite knowing that they wouldn't be allowed to vote when it passed. The Chinese Exclusion Act, which disenfranchised those born in Asian countries, remained in place until 1948. Indigenous women were excluded from the vote until 1924, when Native Americans were recognized as citizens, thanks to efforts of activists like Zit Kalasa, pictured here. She founded the National Council of American Indians in 1926 to continue fighting for Native civil rights. While equal voting rights have been achieved in theory, in practice, the government continues to target Native rights through legal loopholes, including recently in the 2018 midterms when North Dakota implemented constraints that disproportionately affected Native Americans living on tribal land. Suffragists eventually adopted a state-by-state -state strategy. Western states with their smaller pioneer populations were earlier to adopt suffrage than more socially conservative East Coast states. So you can see on this map, the white states are the ones that have granted suffrage. It really is a, was a west to east movement. Much change was affected at the local level until the movement achieved enough support from that an anti-suffrage stance was no longer tenable. So it's kind of like peer pressure. The momentum of local clubs throughout California spurred the statewide suffrage movement. The Votes for Women Club included leaders such as Clara Shortridge Foltz and Maria Lopez de Lowther. Foltz was the first woman attorney in California. She helped, and she's pictured here, she helped organize the state movement and defined women's ability to practice law. Her name may be familiar to Angelinos as the downtown Los Angeles courthouse is named for her. Lopez de Lowther, here left served as an important Spanish language translator during California's successful 1911 suffrage campaign. In addition, she gave bilingual suffrage speeches throughout the state. So here's an example of a leaflet that was handed out uh, in the Spanish language. California suffragists, specifically members of what became Caroline Severance's Friday Morning Club, are believed to have drafted the language used for the 19th Amendment. And that language is here on the screen. Caroline Severance's influential women's club was based in her home in Los Angeles. And uh, Severance is on the far left in this image and Susan B. Anthony is on the far right. In 1878, Severance sent language for a woman's suffrage amendment the club had drafted to her friend, Susan B. Anthony. Anthony passed along to Senator Aaron Sargent. Sargent first introduced the amendment to Congress that year. The same wording was used when the 19th Amendment finally passed in 1919. Legislative efforts in California began in 1871 when Ellen Van Volkenburg sued the Santa Cruz County Clerk for refusing to include her name in the register of voters. She argued that the 14th Amendment granted her citizenship, including voting rights, but the California Supreme Court refused her appeal. In 1879, a state suffrage amendment gained some momentum before being dismissed. In 1894, suffragists held a convention in California to coordinate statewide efforts. However, the suffrage question failed again in 1896 despite support from national leaders campaigning in California. And that, that included Susan B. Anthony and Reverend Anna Shaw. This image here was uh, made by a student, Boyer. It was the illustration adopted for the California suffrage campaign. And it's become one of the most famous images of the suffrage movement. Um, and it was made by a Californian artist. Susan B. Anthony is probably the most famous and recognizable suffragist as a long-standing leader of the movement. So that's part of why she was sent out to campaign. 
Shaw was a physician, uh, Shaw's on the right, and one of the first female Methodist ministers in the United States. So there's a lot of uh, ephemera, merchandise, items branded with suffrage sayings and uh, to encourage uh, women's, women vote to vote. So this is an example of one of those items. The numerous legislative attempts in California in the late 1800s all failed. Interestingly, Southern California voters were pro-women suffrage, but their support was outweighed by Northern California's opposition. And on the left of your screen here are suffragists in San Francisco. Finally, on the 1911 ballot, women's suffrage passed and California became the sixth state to allow women to vote. This success was largely due to the efforts of women's clubs who organized marches, made banners, and printed leaflets in different languages. Support in and around Los Angeles was essential to suffrage's passage in California. It was a landmark for the United States movement as it instantly doubled the number of women able to vote nationally. Selena Solomons documented the California suffrage campaign in her volume, How We Won the Vote in California, published in 1912. An inscribed first edition is currently on loan to the museum from the Dobkin Family Collection of Feminism. And you can see it here or at the exhibition when we reopen. The suffrage movement in Santa Monica followed national trends in supporting statewide suffrage as a stepping stone to national suffrage. Local women's clubs had a huge impact on the acceptance of women's suffrage across the United States. They gave women a forum to come together and share ideas. They were founded as spaces for women to discuss literature, philosophy, and social issues. They also acted as places to strategize action on causes affecting women. Activist women's clubs in Santa Monica included branches of the League of Women Voters, the Philomathians, and the Votes for Women Club, among others. On the left of your screen is the Friday Morning Club uh, meeting at the Miramar, the home of uh, Santa Monica's co-founder. And on the right are members of the Votes for Women Club, or, sorry, the League of Women Voters, which is still active in Santa Monica today. The Santa Monica Bay Women's Club, founded in 1905, was heavily involved in California's 1911 suffrage fight. Their first president, Elmira Stevens, was an outspoken suffragist and advocate for women's issues. That's Elmira Stevens on the left. Their clubhouse on 4th Street was built in 1914 and is one of our city's landmark buildings. It was founded by, it was funded by influential Santa Monica landowner, Arcadia Bandini de Stearns de Baker, a California woman who was also involved in planning and founding the town of Santa Monica. And on the right of your screen are members of the women's club. The family members of Santa Monica's other co-founder, Senator John P. Jones, were suffragists. Jones's wife, Georgina Sullivan Jones, on the left, hosted Susan B. Anthony and Reverend Anna Shaw at her home, Villa Miramar, during their visit to Santa Monica in 1895. The visit was in, sport, in support of the 1896 suffrage ballot campaign in California. The Outlook newspaper noted that Miss Anthony has expressed a desire to meet as many of our citizens as possible. Both women signed the Miramar guest book, which is in the museum's collection and on display for this exhibition. And that's the guest book there. In 1905, Susan B. Anthony and Reverend Anna Shaw returned to California and spoke at a crowded Venice assembly. Georgina Jones attended along with Caroline Severance and Elmira Stevens. Jones's daughter-in-law and Friday Morning Club member Pauline Jones on the left also attended this event. Georgina's daughter, Marion Jones Farquhar on the left, spoke at the Venice event and organized an additional rally at the Sawtell Soldiers Home, which today is the West LA VA. 
1911, Abbott Kinney, who was the founder of Venice, allowed a banner to be hung in Venice in support of women's suffrage. Our local newspaper, The Outlook, provided an endorsement of suffrage several years before its passage. The newspaper also boasted of registering the first woman voter in Santa Monica, which was, it was one of their staff members. And that's the headline that you see here. It says, Outlook is first to enroll a woman voter. Women's suffrage took generations of fighting. Women took extreme risks to bring about a right that many of us take for granted. Legislation is still used to restrict and hamper vulnerable voter populations around the country. Voting is a crucial individual right. It allows us to have a say in the issues that affect our daily lives. Women's ability to vote may seem like a basic right to us, but it took 80 years to achieve. The suffrage movement also left a powerful legacy on protest tactics in the United States. Their militancy was shocking but effective. As the group, as the first group to picket the White House, they set a tradition of protest and inspired successive generations of activism. Thank you very much. Sarah, that was, <clears throat> that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, everyone should note that if you haven't had a chance to come and see our exhibit, that it will be up when we reopen. Uh, so you will have an opportunity to, to come see us in person when it's safe to do so. Um, we're going to take some questions for Sarah now. Um, so this is from Christopher Merritt. Uh, Sarah, he's wondering how accurate or not the role of uh, Glittis Johns, am I pronouncing that correctly, Sarah? I think Glittish so. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> okay. Uh, how accurate or not the role of Glennis Johns as a suffragette was in the Walt Disney film Mary Poppins? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually wondered the same thing. <laughs> um, so the American suffrage movement was very highly influenced by uh, the suffrage movement in the UK. So uh, American suffragists took, took their lead from what was going on in the UK. Um, and I know one thing that is definitely accurate about, uh, uh, about her in that film is that the UK suffrage colors were purple and green. So I don't know if you recall, but her outfit is, you know, she's wearing a purple and green banner and it says suck votes for women on it. Uh, whereas in the United States, the suffrage colors were purple and gold. And uh, we have uh, several examples of suffrage flags in the exhibition. Sarah, so Lynn Morris um, thanks us for the presentation. Um, she's wondering about uh, the Seneca Falls meeting in 1848 um, that Elizabeth Cady Stanton led. And if you can uh, shed any light on that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I didn't mention that mostly for time in this presentation. We do mention it in the exhibition. Um, so the Seneca Falls uh, meeting was extremely important to the suffrage movement. Uh, it included abol abolitionists, suffragists, and they put together a list, a document with a list of points uh, that they were planning to achieve that they felt were important for the suffrage movement. Um, and that's also why, you know, in New York State, there's a very strong, uh, strong roots in suffrage. So there are a lot of um, suffrage museums there and, you know, a lot of the activists were from New York. Thank you. Um, Richard Orton is asking, uh, what about the Pankhurst who is buried in Woodlawn Cemetery? Thank you, Richard. Hi. Um, that's a great question, and I actually don't know who that is. I have not heard of that name, so I'll have to look into it. <laughs> Richard is clarifying that the Pankhursts were three sisters who were active in English suffrage. One of them is buried in Woodlawn. Oh. That's fascinating. Thanks, Thanks Richard. For um, so they must, uh, they must portray her when they do the Woodlawn Living History Tours each year, probably. Uh, Kelly Whiteberg um, says, amazing presentation. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Libby uh, Motika, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, Libby, uh, was, the, the suffrage, was the suffrage movement for women sidelined by the efforts to secure the vote for African Americans? That's a great question. And um, 
I wouldn't say that it was necessarily sidelined, uh, but it did cause a lot of uh, disagreement within the suffrage movement. So uh, there were two primary camps, but really several different views uh, in, with the suffragists. Um, some felt that it was important to, uh, to achieve the vote for women and African American men at the same time. So the suffrage movement, as was mentioned in an earlier question, began in the 1840s, really with the Seneca Falls Conference. Um, and so uh, African American men in America did not achieve the right to vote until 1870. So that's about a you know, 25 year span of the movement. So yes, in those years, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of talk and a lot of um, you know, disagreement within the movement about what was the best approach. Um, and so then there was another uh, group of suffragists who felt that it was important for white women to have the vote first and then African-American men. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a really complex issue within the movement and um, yeah. Thank you for answering that. Um, were there any examples of males who impeded the suffrage efforts Susan Larson would like to know? That's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, I would say primarily by uh, their, you know, public opinion, you know, there were many uh, newspaper articles, newspaper opinion pieces deriding of female suffragists, you know, as I showed in the beginning, caricatures, um, making fun of them, belittling them, uh, kind of went on and on. And uh, really, suffragists relied on men to give them the vote because men were the one who voted in elections. So they really had to work hard and that's why it was such a long struggle, why there were so many failed attempts. So um, I didn't cover the specifics, but there were many times that uh, a nationwide, nationwide legislation was uh, put to Congress for them to vote and, you know, grant suffrage to the entire country. And that kept failing again and again. So that's why they moved to the state by state, uh, state by state uh, strategy. Um, so yeah, it, that just worked, you know, it was a sort of uh, turned the tide slowly, but uh, they gained enough momentum that state by state, they, they made it happen. Uh, Joyce Fox is wondering uh, the name of the Native American tribe that allowed women to vote. Yeah, so I can actually spell it for you because it um, is not said so much the way it sounds. Um, it was the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and that's spelled H-A-U-D-E-N-O-S-A-U-N-E-E. -E and uh, they were a really significant um, nation of multiple tribal groups in New York State. Uh, you mentioned the California Eagle. Uh, were there any suffragist newspapers in California? Uh, Mia McMorris is asking. Yeah, so the California Eagle was actually an African-American newspaper, but it was woman-owned, so it touched on suffrage issues. There was also another African-American newspaper in Los Angeles that also touched on suffrage issues. Um, it also kind of goes to that point of, you know, whether uh, votes for African-American men should be achieved before votes for women. So they kind of talk about whether or not the Black community should support women's suffrage. Um, and so usually the, it happened that women's organizations would publish their own newsletters and newspapers of sorts. Um, so there aren't any actual suffrage newspapers that I know of, but a lot of sort of newsletters or, or short um, magazines that were put out regularly. Excellent. Um, Maggie Phillips asks uh, that, or says that you mentioned the suffrage movement in Southern California was more strongly supported than in Northern California. And it seems that in other states, seems that in other states, who and what were the primary forces against suffrage in Southern California? Um, the alcohol lobby was a huge one. <laughs> so really, the alcohol lobby uh, was, was very strong. They had a lot of power. Um, and having them against the suffragists did prove challenging. Um, but then also just generally, you know, this was the, the convention. So, uh, you know, white 
men were not eager to give up their power, you know, which is, I think, what was, it was seen at the time, the idea that if they allowed women to vote, you know, often women were equated to people whose brains didn't work properly, you know, so they really just thought it was kind of a joke in a way that um, the idea to let women vote and, and to, for them to even think about these issues. Uh, Kelly Davis asks, how did it work if women could vote in California in 1911, but suffrage nationally didn't pass until 1920? Did women vote in the national races? Yeah, that's a really great question. And yes, once women achieved the vote in their state, they were able to vote nationally in national elections. Um, so yeah, that is the case. Um, Ted Mark says, thank you for the great lecture, Sarah. I'm sure we all agree. Um, he's curious, once the right to vote was achieved, um, can you say more about what the issues these California groups focused on? Yeah, social issues were one of their primary targets. So um, in particular, the African-American suffragists in Los Angeles focused a lot of their efforts on social issues. So um, they, you know, they legit, or I guess, uh, worked for legislation on things like childcare, which was really revolutionary at that time. Childcare for work, working women, um, and you know, again, temperance was something that it eventually passed. So that was a big, uh, you know, a big thing that female voters did support. And um, you know, sometimes people ask, well, what's the connect connection between temperance, alcohol use, and social issues? And it really was a very strong connection for a lot of people. So um, that, that was a big one that they worked for and eventually achieved, as we know, a prohibition passed. Uh, and Libby Motika is wondering, did the ERA movement, um, the Equal Rights Amendment movement, take any specific strategies from uh, the suffragist movement beyond the state by state effort? That is a great question. And I actually don't know. We touch on the ERA a little bit in the exhibition, and of course it's very closely linked with uh, the suffrage amendment, um, the women's suffrage amendment. Uh, of course, we know that it, it was never ratified, even though it passed. Um, so yeah, it, it's pretty closely linked. I know a lot of the same groups who were suffragists also worked on the Equal Rights Amendment. It was a sort of a followed. Uh, if you missed my plea in the first part of, uh, of, of our webinar here, um, you know, we sure could use your support. Again, uh, you know, all of our uh, fundraising is based on uh, interacting with you. Uh, so whether it's uh, you come to the museum um, for, and, and pay an admission or, or you come to our gift shop and shop or um, you come to our uh, a gala or any of, any of our other in-person fundraising events, that's uh, that's how we generate our money as a, as a nonprofit organization. So we sure would appreciate your support. Again, Christina has uh, put that link into our chat function. Anything you can give would be very much appreciated. Okay. Well, Sarah, thank you so much uh, for starting us off. Um, this, is, this has been great. Um, you know, I, I'm sure it's uh, lost on no one. Um, and it certainly wasn't something we planned, but that, uh, you know, this evening's presentation um, focused on issues of uh, social justice uh, and peaceful protests um, and that uh, those, that the roots of that um, were largely born in the suffrage movement. And so we thank you um, for that reminder um, and, and for teaching us that this evening. Um, just a, uh, just a, a preview of, of coming events. So next week, um, we're going to feature uh, the second one of, uh, of these lectures, um, and it's going to be a great one. Uh, this gentleman has spoken in person uh, at the museum uh, previously. His name's Ted Tanaka, um, and Ted experienced life um, in a Japanese internment camp in World War II when he was a little boy. Um, and uh, and he's, uh, he's a compelling guy and very informative, and it should be an extraordinarily interesting talk. And so we invite you back here same time next week. Um, for details on our Throwback Thursday program, you can visit santamonicahistory.org. That's our website. Um, and go to our events section and just click on Throwback Thursdays and you'll see uh, the details for the upcoming event. And you can register 
uh, right there on the website. You can also uh, donate to us right there on the website too. And, and again, we do appreciate that. Um, we thank you uh, for coming out this, uh, this evening. Um, we hope that you'll join us next week and uh, as our series continues. Um, throughout, uh, throughout the summer. We're, we're, uh, we're excited to be able to bring these to you. So uh, thanks for being our, our virtual guest. Uh, we look so forward uh, to when we can welcome you back in person. Uh, but for now, uh, we're here with you in this way. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.